Good morning, and welcome to the Standing in the Shadow of Love, the Role of the Black Church in Youth Suicide Prevention webinar. My name is Brandi Brooks, and aside from being the moderator this morning, I am a contract manager for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Suicide Prevention Program, the sponsors of the webinar. Before I introduce our presenter, Dr. Sherry davis Mullock, I would like to go over a few housekeeping issues. First, should anyone experience any technical difficulties with either the audio or video for this webinar, please dial 1-800-843-9166. Again, that's 1-800-843-9166. And a ReadyTalk representative will be more than happy to help. Second, all telephone lines are muted except mine and Dr. Mullock's. So please use the chat function to type in any questions you may have. Given the number of participants, Dr. Mullick will do her very best to answer as many questions as possible as we go along and at the end of the webinar during the question and answer period. Now that I've gotten that out of the way, let me introduce our presenter, Dr. Sherry Davis Mullick. Dr. Mullick brings over 25 years of experience in psychology and 10 years in ministry to address the challenges and rewards of working with faith-based and mental health organizations to address the growing problem of suicide among young people in the African American community. Dr. Mullick is an associate professor of psychology at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. She teaches undergraduate and doctoral students in the area of clinical, slash community psychology and conducts research on the risk and protective factors associated with suicidal behaviors in African American teens and young adults, with a special emphasis on developing suicide prevention programs in African American churches. Dr. Mullick and her husband, Gary Mullick Jr., serve as the founding co-pastors of the beloved community church in Fort Washington, Maryland whose holistic ministry focuses on transforming hearts, restoring spirits, and empowering minds. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to Dr. Mullick. Thank you. Please stand by. Okay, so thank you so much, Brandy, for that wonderful introduction. And so before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that it's really important, I think, that whenever I do a presentation, I do like to um, go ahead and kind of talk with you about um, my background a little bit, because I think that all of us bring our own context to whatever we're doing, and that certainly shapes not just the way we see things, but the way we do things. So I just wanted to kind of point out to you the various contexts that I have. So if you look at the slide, you'll see lots of different pictures. And so in this first picture, this is me as a professor at George Washington University, where I teach um, doctoral students in clinical community psychology, focusing much more on suicide re prevention research. So that's one of my contexts. But I also have another context, which is this family picture right here. So I'm a wife. Uh, and a mother. These are two children here. I didn't, couldn't find a picture with three kids, but um, I've been married for nearly 25 years to the love of my life, Guy Molak Jr., and I'm also the proud mom of three children, Amber, Jelani, and Diara, who ranged in ages between 20 and 16. And then you'll see this picture up here in my upper right-hand corner. And in addition to wearing the hats of a professor and a wife and a mother, I'm also the co-pastor of the beloved community church. It's just in the suburb of Washington, D.C. My husband and I co-pastor that church together, and that's he and I preaching together. And that church has been in existence for about two and a half years. And certainly I bring my experience as a pastor and as a minister to the work that I do. And then in this lower right-hand corner, you see a picture of someone who's looking, showing eat block uh, cards, and that's me as a clinician. And I've also been a practicing licensed psychologist for about 25 years, where I specialize particularly in um, treating people who suffer from depression and sometimes suicide. Most of my clinical work is primarily done in faith-based communities. I don't do private practice or group practice work anymore. And then last but not least, these are two dogs. These are our dogs, Leo, Leo Petito, who is a golden retriever mix, who's five years old. And this is Jasmine Taz, Jazz, who is our 
uh, almost 12-year-old uh, miniature schnauzer. So these are all of the perspectives that I bring with me when I do my work. Now, when, it, when we do that, I also wanted to know a little bit about your background. So if you, we're going to do a poll right now, and if you could just sort of tell me what's your primary background. I know that some of you may work or you see your role as more than one, but if you just sort of pick the primary role that you're usually in, particularly as it relates to suicide prevention in the African American community. And you'll see here on the poll that we have lots of different um, selections for you to pick from. Unfortunately, you can only pick um, from one of ten. If you could go ahead and pick, you know, are you a minister, a program coordinator, a health services provider, a professional um, program administrator, a school counselor in a high school or middle school, uh, maybe perhaps you're a counselor in a university setting or on the faculty at a university, are you a trainer, a researcher, or a graduate student either in um, the mental health field or in seminary. So if you can go ahead and uh, fill that out right now. And I um, make sure you push the button that says Submit. And we can see that some responses are coming up now. So we have some counselors, and we have uh, lots of program people. And we'll just wait a couple of more minutes. And we have uh, some graduate students in the group. And I think we are just about finished with most people responding. We'll wait a few more seconds. Okay, great. Okay, so if we look, and we can see the results of that. So people have lots of different backgrounds. We again see lots of program coordinators, some ministers, some health services providers, uh, some trainers, and some graduate students. Okay, and again, we're, we apologize if we didn't have your category up there, but it's good so we know that we have a diverse audience um, who's participating in the webinar today. And before we also get started, I just want to do a brief overview with you of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, as you know, this is about um, suicide prevention, standing in the shadows of love. We're going to be primarily focusing on suicide in the African American community. And one thing I meant to mention earlier when I was talking about my context is that we are going to be talking primarily from the perspective of the Christian church, because that's the church that I um, am a minister in, and predominantly from an African American church perspective, because that's also the context I'll be sharing with you today. Again, it doesn't mean that these um, issues don't come up in other contexts and other faith-based communities, but that's going to be our, time, our context for today. Okay, so one of the things we're going to be talking about today is what is suicide. And there's lots of different definitions out there, and sometimes people use terms interchangeably. So we want to make sure that we're all on the same page and that when we use terms like suicide attempt or suicide ideation or suicide gesture, that we're all, we all mean the same thing. So we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about that. Then we're going to focus a little bit on suicide in the African-American community. Um, because that's going to be one of our contexts for today. And then we're going to talk about and cover what are some of the risk and protective factors that are associated with suicide, which sometimes can differ in different communities. And then we're going to talk about what does the Bible really say about suicide. It's very interesting because we come from different faith traditions, and so we may have heard different things about what the Bible says about suicide. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on this and um, talk about some of the historical perspectives on this. What does the contemporary church say? And we're even going to go through some um, scriptures from the um, Christian Bible and talk about what the Bible does and does not say about suicide. And then finally, we're going to talk about, really importantly, what can the faith community do to help people get help for problems with suicide. I'm an eternally optimistic person, so I believe it's not enough to just identify problem areas, but let's try to come up with some solutions today. And some of those things will be some really practical things about what um, faith-based communities and mental health professionals can do to partner together so that we can combat the issue of suicide in the African American community. Okay? And so I'm certainly, um, while I'm talking, um, what we're probably going to do, we're periodically going to go ahead and stop for questions. And so certainly if you have questions as I'm going along, please feel free to type them in. And then there will be periodic periods of time during the presentation when I'll actually stop and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Okay, so um, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Okay, so 
When we think about suicide in the African American community, in any community really, it's a challenge because we know this across all ethnic groups, all economic backgrounds, that every 16 minutes someone dies by suicide. In fact, in 2007, which is the year for which we have the most recent statistics, we know that over 33,000 persons died by suicide in the United States alone. And that's a problem. That's something we should be concerned about because more people die from suicide than they die from homicides. And that's something that we should be concerned about. We also should be something that we want to do something about to change that because that's something that we can definitely prevent. So we're also going to be looking at definitions. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to definitions right now. And so uh, we're going to start with definitions of suicide ideation, suicide attempts, and suicide, what we call completions. And so we're going to go ahead and turn to those now. Thank you. Please stand by. Suicide ideation are the thoughts that people have of either harming or killing oneself. And these thoughts... Um, can vary in severity, and when we're doing or trying to assess suicide, we tend to look at frequency. So how often is the person thinking about suicide? We're going to be looking at intensity, and by intensity what I mean is we're going to be looking at um, how detailed is the person thinking about suicide. Are the thoughts really disturbing or are they sort of fleeting, um, sort of something that just crosses one's mind, or is this something that a person is really feeling preoccupied by? And then we're looking at duration. We're looking at what's the length of time that we're talking about that you've been feeling or thinking about this. So again, for suicide ideation, these are thoughts about harming oneself. We're looking at frequency, intensity, and the duration of the thoughts. Then we use the word suicide attempts. We're talking about a person who is thinking about engaging in some injurious behavior, behavior that could harm the cell, and the really key here is that the behavior has to be directed towards the self. And also key issue here is where the person intends to die, so that the intent of the behavior is to hurt oneself and the intent of the behavior is to die. Now, what's important about that is although the person may intend to die, it is also true or the case that a suicide attempt may or may not result in an actual injury. So the key here is not so much whether or not there's actually an injury, but that the behavior has the potential to injure the person and that the behavior is, is being engaged in because the person is intending, at least at that moment, to die. Then when we talk about suicide, oftentimes you'll also hear researchers talk about suicide. You'll hear us say something like suicide completions. Um, most researchers in this area don't use the word suicide, committing suicide, because the word committing sounds like something that's positive and it's, um, suicidal behavior is a tragedy, so we don't want to imply that it's something positive, something that you aim towards. So you will often hear suicide uh, researchers or clinicians talk about suicide completions. A suicide completion is death that is caused by a self-directed injurious behavior. Again, so the behavior is intended to harm the cell. And again, you see that the intent was to die as a result of the behavior. And these three definitions are the definitions that are used by the IOM, or the Institute, Institute of Medicine, which came out with a special report on suicide in 2002. Okay, so given those definitions, one of the things that we have to ask ourselves, because you may think those seem pretty straightforward or clear, then what's the issue is, why is it so hard to assess suicide? Why is it so difficult to figure out whether or not someone, in fact, is feeling or thinking or, or experiencing suicidal behavior or thoughts? So I wanted to ask you guys that question. Why do you think it might be hard, given the definitions that we just went over, why it may be difficult to assess suicide? You just can write in a few um, brief phrases or um, words to talk about why you think it might be difficult to assess suicide or to figure out whether or not someone is suicidal. And then we'll kind of look at what people think about that. Yep, so far we don't have anybody sharing their thoughts. You can just put down one a word two-word responses, or some people are, are um, 
Great. Okay, so you're, make sure you're, you hit submit so that you um, we can see your answers. Okay, we have more people kind of chiming in here. Great. Okay, people have lots of different thoughts. Okay, and so some of the things that people are saying is sometimes people don't share what's going on with them or they may not be upfront or, all, or honest about how they're feeling. So maybe cultural issues, which we're going to be talking about later on, that make it difficult for people to talk about how they're really feeling. Um, a lot of shame involved, right? A lot of people talked about shame, fear of a yes answer. Uh, sometimes it's hard to figure out what's the difference between thinking about it and whether or not someone is really intending to, to uh, take their lives. Okay. Um, sometimes it's hard to assess. So these are all great answers. Okay. So that's good. That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, so a lot of you sort of hit the nail on the head. Why is this so difficult to assess? Because sometimes it's really hard to tell what are people really thinking. People may not feel comfortable being really honest or upfront with you or being very specific. And sometimes when we um, are thinking or concerned about someone may be suicidal, it's also hard for us to sometimes ask people. And sometimes we are afraid that if we ask people um, very directly, are you thinking of attempting suicide or harming yourself, that we in fact will plant the idea of suicide um, in their mind. But actually the research suggests that that's not the case, that most of the time when people are thinking about suicide and you ask them a direct question about it, they're actually relieved that you've almost in some ways given them permission to talk about something that's bothering them. Another reason why, which I think one of you sort of alluded to, was sometimes it's really hard to figure out, is this a real attempt or just to cry for help? And the issue with that, because when we call the um, quote-unquote cries for help, sometimes we call those suicide gestures, and the difference between uh, an attempt and a gesture is that with this suicide gesture, the person is not intending to die, but is really a cry for help. They're trying to get some attention. But the difficulty there is that even if it's a gesture, sometimes cries for help can be fatal. So we really have to take both suicide gestures and suicide attempts really seriously, because even if the person's not intending to die, it's important to recognize that that person needs to get some professional help. Okay, so now we're going to move on to um, talking more specifically about suicidal behaviors in African Americans. And so we know that between 1980 and 1995, there was a dramatic increase in the number of suicides, particularly among African American youth, and the, there was an, actually a 233% increase. And most of this traumatic increase in suicide deaths was due to deaths from firearms in African-American males. African-American women actually have one of the lowest suicide rates of any racial ethnic group, but we also know that African-American and Latina high school, female high school students actually have higher suicide attempt rates than white female high school students. And so in general, we know that, at, that men in general um, complete suicide much more uh, frequently than women do, but women attempt suicide much more frequently than men do. So it's, I think, um, really important to recognize that even if a group has a lower rate of completions, it doesn't mean that it's not a problem in that community because, as I just said, for African-American young females, actually their, their attempt rates are higher than white. So you have to look at not just culture but also age when you're looking at rates. Okay, so while the suicide rates for African-American males has been in decline since 2002, which is good news, the issue that we need to be concerned about is that suicide still remains the third leading cause of death for African-American um, youth between the ages of 15 and 24. Okay, so why the changes in suicide rates in African-American youth? And there's lots of people who have lots of ideas and hypotheses about this. We're not really sure exactly why, but I did want to share with you some of the thinking behind why there might be increases in um, suicidal behavior in African-American youth, particularly over this last 20, 25-year period. So one theory is that, that the gains in the civil rights movement, that's what CRM stands for, in the 1960s and 70s, although there were certainly uh, economic and educational and um, 
uh, occupational gains in the black community, that some of those gains may have inadvertently undermined some of the strengths that were always unique and indigenous to the black community. Because one of the things that happened in the 1960s and 70s with the civil rights movement is that people who were uh, formerly living in predominantly segregated communities began to move out of the communities and began to be in more integrated environments. And so what began to happen with that is that people who had the means, the economic means to move did, but that created an economic segregation. And so, and you may have read in the newspapers or seen the reports where the gap between incomes between poor African Americans and middle income African Americans is actually even wider than it is in other communities. So there's economic segregation. You also lose positive role models. I remember when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s that um, within the three block radius of my house, there were all different kinds of people who lived there. There was, in fact, my pediatrician lived around the corner from us and I babysat for him. There were college professors, there were mechanics, there were ministers, there were milkmen, my dad worked at the post office, and so there were lots of different kinds of role models that we could use to think about our future goals and aspirations. When you have severe economic segregation, you don't really see that that mixture of role models in the community like you used to. There's also, with people moving out of the community, um, what you start seeing is that people um, don't live in the same community for long periods of time, and you see people moving in and out of communities more frequently. For more frequently. And what that can result in is a lack or a decrease in what's called collective efficacy, which is a sense of community. And again, I remember when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, I'm kind of dating myself here, um, we never had paid babysitters because my entire extended family lived within four blocks of my house. So if my mom and dad were at home, then I would go up the street to one of my aunts or uncle's houses. Uh, right of passage in my family was that when you became 12 or 13 years old, you babysat the younger cousins. And we weren't even allowed to charge our aunts or uncles for that. That was just something you did in your family. So I never went to child care. I never had a paid babysitter. My older cousins babysat me, and then I, in turn, babysat younger cousins. And so that's a sense of collective efficacy. Or some of you may remember where you had a neighbor who was the nosy neighbor who would, knew what always sat outside on the porch or who always hung out the window, and they knew everything that was going on in the community. And if you know you did something wrong or, or, or misbehaving in the street on your way home, then that person would call your parents, your mom and dad, and let them know that you were misbehaving so you were in trouble before you even got home. Well, that sense of all the children belong to the community, that there are multiple parenting roles going on, that's what we mean by collective efficacy. But when you live in a community where people – don't live in the community for long periods of time anymore where people kind of move in and out um, or stay a year or two and people don't know their neighbors, one of the disadvantages of that is you lose a sense of collective efficacy, you lose a sense of community, and you lose a sense of it takes a village to raise a child. And there's a lot of protectiveness involved in collective efficacy that you might be lo losing or missing out on. We also similarly know that um, when families don't live as close together anymore, then you lose some of the protective functioning of kinship ties. And I don't know, many of you may have grown up with what we call fictive kin or play aunts and uncles and godparents. And so even my children today have multiple aunts and uncles who are, or play cousins. And that also gives you a sense of being protected, um, not only in your community, but with a larger sense of family. And then we also know that with this economic segregation that I talked about earlier, that the economic opportunities for the urban poor um, is more dismal, but it's also more dismal in the context of having higher expectations. So on one hand, the civil rights movement really raised the expectations of people in the community that there could be equity, and there could be justice, and there could be equal treatment for people. In the context of that expectation, to not to be able to find a job or to be chronically unemployed or underemployed, um, to not be able to make ends meet for your family may be actually more stressful for people. Now, these changes in the African American community that we've just talked about seem to have affected young men and women differently. So one thing I want you to think about is why do you think there might be a different impact on men versus women in the African American community, particularly thinking about younger people under the age of 35. And again, you can just sort of put in brief words or phrases about why do you think there may be um, a different impact? Why do you think that the suicide rates 
for African-American males is actually higher. This is, when we say suicide rates, we're talking about not attempts, but completions. So if you could go ahead and, and, and fill in what you think that might be due to. Okay, so we have some people uh, signing in. Don't forget to push submit. Okay, so people are saying gender stereotypes and stigma associated, uh, fewer father figures, fewer intact families, more families have moms as heads of household, men are less likely to reach out to su for support systems, men are uh, socialized to be the primary breadwinner, men are taught to deal with their emotions differently, peer pressure to join gangs. So lots of people talking about uh, men not having uh, either permission or socialized to share emotionally, and men may be feeling more pressure. Okay, these are all great. So we're going to go ahead and um, no role models, very little support. Okay, these are all great. And many of you are, are absolutely, again, hitting the nail on the head. So. Some people believe, researchers believe, the stress may be more acute for males, predominantly for the reasons that you said. One, men are not socialized um, to talk about their feelings. They're not really given permission to do that. Um, many of you also talked about this issue of the breadwinner. And some researchers, particularly in sociology, think that it's the inability to be the breadwinner um, for African-American males because they're more likely to be underemployed and unemployed that results in a greater gender role violation. So in other words, if you have an expectation that you should be the breadwinner but you don't have the avenue or the means to do that, that um, gender role violation, that not being able to provide for a family, is much more stressful and acute for African-American men than African-American women. It's not that African-American women don't also have stressors, but there's not a gender role violation because we... Um, still live in, in a predominantly in a culture where we expect women to provide more of the nurturing and sustenance in the home environment. So there's not as much of a gender role violation for women. And then as many of you also said, which is also true in research supports, African American women tend to make um, tend to access community and social supports more frequently than men do. They're more likely to talk to their friends, they're more likely to be involved in social clubs. They're more likely to go to church and be actively involved in their church. They're more likely to go to their family for support, both economic and uh, what we call emotional support. And they're more likely to go to counseling. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more later on. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about what are some of the risk and uh, protective factors associated with suicide. And again, we're going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, I think you'll have access to the slides later on after the actual conference. So we tend to look at uh, risk factors. We'll look at them at the individual level and the family level. So one of the best predictors of a future attempt for suicide is a previous attempt, particularly within the first six months of the attempt. We know that depression is a big risk factor. Um, many, many people who make suicide attempts suffer from depression. It's not the only mental disorder that someone can suffer from who is suicidal, but certainly that's one of the leading candidates. Delinquent behavior is also a problem area. There are many people who believe that some of the acting out or conduct problems that you see in young men or delinquent behaviors are really mass depression, and that um, because young men aren't given permission or it's not okay or cool to talk about feeling depressed, sad, or blue, what they do instead is engage in delinquent behavior or engage in substance abuse. Recent losses, this could be a loss of a family member or a loved one. This could also involve parents being separated and divorced, um, having to move frequently so that you have a loss of support systems, um, having a physical illness, particularly a chronic physical illness, um, is also a, a problem area. I think um, in terms of looking at family factors, having a non-supportive family, and this isn't necessarily a family that is um, abusive. What we mean by that is a family who 
perhaps maybe because people working multiple jobs are just not there. And one of the important um, risk factors, particularly for kids under the age of 15, is whether or not parents are monitoring their behavior. Parents are, are available enough so that you actually know where your kids are and what's going on with them. Having a history of physical or sexual abuse is also um, a, a strong risk factor, particularly in women, and having a history of mental illness in the family. We also tend to look at, um, someone asked me to pause here for a second, um, several people have asked about recent loss and how do you define what a recent loss is. Let me just go back to that slide, for example. Normally when we say recent loss, we're talking about within the last 12 to 18 months. Sometimes when people experience a loss, it may not be obvious to everyone around them that they're really suffering um, in silence because particularly if it's been a death in the family, um, sometimes the busyness of involved, being involved in making funeral arrangements um, sort of keeps you busy and keeps your mind off of the loss. Or, or, or for example, in a job loss, someone may initially be really busy trying to find another job. But as time goes on, what tends to happen is if you feel like your grief is not being resolved with this and you're not able to access support systems, also in the death of a loved one, everyone else kind of goes back to their life and kind of goes back to business as usual, but it's really hard for that person to do that. So I think that um, it's really important to, to keep that in mind. Okay. I see there's lots of good questions coming out. What I'm going to do is move on, and then I think in about a minute or two we're going to have time for questions, and then we can sort of address some of the questions that are coming up. Okay. In terms of community risk factors, um, feeling isolated from others, the stigma associated with either feeling depressed, having a mental illness, something that someone just brought up about um, same-sex attractions, or certainly we know recently in the news there's been a lot of issues around young gay youth and bullying, and so the stigma that's associated with um, having same-gendered attractions or homosexuality is a stigma that young people face, which can also be placed them at suicide risk. And we do know that gay and lesbian, bisexual and transgender youth are at higher risk, not for suicide completions, but they are at higher risk for suicide attempts. Uh, barriers to access to treatment, if people cannot get to treatment, if they have easy access to lethal methods, so this is primarily firearms, um, also um, very toxic medications or pills. And then also copycat clusters. Now, one of the questions, again, was talking about the risk factors with gay and lesbian, by, uh, sexual and transgender youth. And one of the concerns that we do have is because of the a lot of media attention being paid lately, uh, which is necessarily, not necessarily a bad thing, to this particular um, group of youth around bullying. But what you can also have happen is when there's a lot of media attention, you can also get what are called copycat or cluster suicides, particularly in young people. So it's not so much that you shouldn't report it in the media, but it's how you report it in the media that's really important. You don't want to romanticize it in the media because that's when you're much more likely to get the copycat suicides or the cluster suicides. So it's a little bit difficult to assess that right now. Now, there are also some things that can protect people from suicide. Those include things, again, at the individual, family, and the community level. So examples of protective factors are when young people have good coping skills, uh, when they actively use spiritual beliefs in their coping, when they have good problem-solving skills, which are similar to coping skills. Having a supportive and cohesive family is very protective. And at the community level, belonging to church, uh, and this is not just going to church or taking your kids to church, this is actually having them actively engage in the church in either a youth ministry, a choir, or, or there are lots of different activities that youth can engage in in church because it's that sense of belonging to a group and being integrated in the group that's really protective. It's not going to church per se. Having cultural beliefs that discourage suicide. And so if it's, ironically, if it's more um, of a, a stigma, not so much a stigma, but if it's not actively encouraged that you complete suicide within your cultural belief system, that discouraging uh, message that you get or norm actually does help to prevent suicide. Having cultural and religious values that encourage help seeking is really critical and then having easy access to mental health care. And we're going to be talking a lot today about um, encouraging help-seeking in, in cultural and religious groups. 
Okay, I want to shift gears just a little bit and talk with you about um, some cultural differences that we know that exist in the, um, the expression of suicidal behaviors. We do know that African Americans are less likely to use drugs during an actual suicide attempt, particularly this, we're again talking predominantly about um, youth who are between the ages of 15 and 24. And most people are surprised to hear that, but in general, African American people under the age of 25 actually um, are less likely to use drugs, period, and so that's probably what's going on there. Um, they're less likely to express suicide intent. What we mean by that is during a suicide crisis, if you ask the person, was this a suicide attempt, or if you ask the person in the counseling office, are you intending to harm yourself or attempt suicide, African-American youth are much more likely to deny that this is actually an attempt or that they're thinking about suicide. Um, African-Americans in general, regardless of the age group, are less likely to complain about having a depressed mood, feeling sad or blue, um, and so they're much more likely to have um, physical complaints, what we call somatic complaints, complaining about body aches, headaches, stomach aches, et cetera. So it's really important that if you have a physician that they ask about mood when people have a lot of body complaints and there doesn't seem to be a physical cause for those problems. And then we know that African Americans are much less likely to express a sense of hopelessness, particularly among our youth. What I have noticed over the years is that they seem to be very fatalistic, um, they don't think that they're going to necessarily have good outcomes, but it's not hopelessness. It's not a um, my life doesn't matter anymore or um, wow, you know, life is really horrible. It's more a sense of this is the best that I can expect. This is the best that I think is going to do. There's so many young people I work with who don't really expect to live to be 30, and so they engage in sometimes really um, high-risk behaviors, not so much because they're even impulsive per se, but they just sort of feel that they're not going to live to be an, a middle or older adult, and so they're going to sort of take life and live it for its fullest now. So when you talk with them, there's not a sense of hopelessness, but there is a sense of fatalistic um, sort of expectations about the future. And then we know that African Americans are more likely to engage in victim-precipitated homicide. Some of you may know this as suicide by cop. This is a situation where, again, you see this pr predominantly in young African-American and Latino males. And what you'll see is they won't actively do something to harm themselves, but indirectly what they will do, they'll put themselves in a situation either with law enforcement or sometimes in gang activity where the likelihood that someone else will kill them is pretty high. And so um, I had a former um, client of mine one time who was carrying an, an unloaded gun at the school, and when I talked with him about that, because he was being bullied, he told me that what he wanted to do was he didn't want, he knew that this person would probably shoot him back because, in fact, that person carried a loaded gun, but he didn't want to go out as a wimp. And so at least if he was going to die, he was going to die in what he called a blaze of glory. So that's an example of victim precipitated homicide. And then we also know that African Americans are much more likely to have their suicides misclassified as either accidents or um undetermined causes of death. And that's predominant because African Americans are more likely to use methods that um, leads to the, the results of the, of the death questionable. For example, they're more likely to die from drowning, stabbings, and car accidents. And so when a coroner or medical examiner is not sure about that, it's, not, it's difficult for them to, to definitively rule whether or not it's a suicide, they're more likely to either call those deaths questionable, homicides, or accidents. Okay, so now we can take some time for questions, and let me see here. So one person asked earlier, isn't same-sex attraction and fear of instigating those risk factors also a mentionable factor? This is, I believe, a reference to the um, risk factors. And so, yes, same-sex attractions and, and um, kids being afraid of either coming out or being bullied about that, that's also a risk factor. Um, that might, we don't have any data or research on this, but that might be um, even more of a problem in the African American community because the African American community tends to be more conservative about sexuality and tends to have um, more homophobic stances, particularly in the black church. So that's something that's really important. Um, someone also asked a question about what is your opinion on the risk factor of lack of sufficient inpatient treatment due to insurance limitation guidelines? 
Good question. Not really sure because, again, we don't have data on that, but certainly um, as a general rule, act, people not having access to care, and particularly people who are, um, have severe impairment who need to be hospitalized, who are either underinsured or lack the insurance um, to be hospitalized, that certainly can also be a factor. So that's an excellent point. And I know for the people who work in that area, it's a very frustrating point. Um, Data on homelessness in African American teens. No, there isn't any data on homeless, homelessness in African American teens. But again, um, certainly we know that homeless, um, not just teens, but people in general, are at risk for having a host of mental disorders, including it could be depression and suicide. Um, and also, obviously, they don't have access to treatment. And also, uh, when you're not able to get your basic needs met for clothing and shelter and food, it's really difficult um, and very stressful experience. And so, yes, those youth would also be, uh, we, we could imagine that they would also be um, at risk for suicide. Um, also, there's a question, is there any data on children exposed to domestic violence and suicide? Not a lot of data on domestic violence per se in children, but we do know that Nadine Caslow, who is a researcher at Emory University in Atlanta, has done some excellent work on uh, looking at the exposure of domestic violence um, in African-American women. And they clearly have a, not so much suicide completions, but again, much higher rates of suicide attempts. Um, and certainly we also know that people who have a history of having been sexually or physically abused or being exposed to um, family violence in childhood as a young adults are at higher risk of suicide attempts. Okay? So... I think those are all the questions that I see right now, so we're going to go ahead and move ahead. And now we're going to shift gears and talk about what does the Bible really say about suicide. You may or may not have heard that it says a lot of things, so I'm going to ask you guys again to pipe in. And I wanted to know how many of you have heard that suicide is an unpardonable sin? How many of you have ever heard that either a minister uh, mom, a rabbi, or maybe your parents, or you've heard, or you just heard in passing that suicide is an unpardonable sin. It's a sin that you cannot be forgiven for. Wow. So definitely most people have heard that. Okay, just wait another minute to see if everyone has, has uh, responded. And I think so overwhelmingly, you can see 96% of you said, yes, you have heard that. Okay, probably what I should have asked you was how many of you believe that. So we're going to look at that. Okay, so what we do know about suicide is that the early church fathers struggled with the understanding of what people sometimes call voluntary death. And one of the things that they had to struggle with was what's the difference between seeking to be killed, allowing yourself to be killed, and killing oneself. So what's the difference between seeking to be killed, which would be in our modern terminology, victim precipitated homicide or suicide by cop, um, were you actively seeking to be killed? Two, what's allowing yourself to be killed? So you're not so much trying to be killed, but um, if you're in a situation and someone could kill you, you sort of passively let that happen. And the third thing would be killing oneself, which is actively engaging in behavior with the intent to kill yourself, so what we would now call suicide completion. So the same things that we're grappling with today are the same issues that the the biblical um, founders and the early church fathers, founders of the Christian church, were struggling with that issue as well. So these same dilemmas or issues or conflicts are also presented in the biblical text. And again, when we talk about the biblical text, we're talking about the Christian Bible, and we're talking about what some people call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Okay, so We're talking about the entire text. And so it's difficult to study suicide in the Bible because our contemporary understanding of suicide and our views about voluntary death are very different now than they were at the time the texts were written. 
So our current views of suicide as sin were actually shaped by Augustine, who was an African bishop in the 4th century of the 300s. And he viewed suicide as a form of murder. And he viewed it as unpardonable because he felt that there was no time to repent when you took your own life. So in other words, that when you were killing yourself in that act, you didn't have any time to actually ask God for forgiveness for your behavior. Now, it's important to understand, we, talk, we started off our session today talking about context. And so whenever you read something or hear something in the Bible, it's really important for you to realize that it's important to look at the context in which it occurred or was written. And so during Augustine's time, his viewpoint about suicide was shaped in part by philosophers of his day and also really importantly by a crisis that was going on in the early church. Okay, so Augustine was very upset because there was a group of people called Donatists, and the Donatists were considered to be heretics or people who were um, teaching false beliefs or, or, um, or false teachings in the early church. And one of the things that the Donatists believed was that if you engage in the act of martyrdom, if you martyred yourself for Christianity, then you could skip purgatory, which was a belief that's still true in the Catholic Church, but was a belief in all of the early church, that you were able to skip purgatory, purgatory and go directly to heaven. And so what began to happen was people would get together and have mass suicides. And they would do this, they would have um, sort of praise and worship services, and then people would get together and kill each other or kill themselves. And this became a crisis in the early church. And so because of this crisis, that was what made Augustine decide and declare that suicide was an unpardonable sin to stop people from engaging in these mass suicides. And Augustine based this decision, they were called edicts then, which are teachings or sort of rules or, or laws that the church um, puts out to the community to govern the community's behavior. So his edict was based on Exodus 20, the 13th chapter, which says, Thou shalt not kill. So those of you who are familiar with the Ten Commandments, this is one of the scriptures where um, people talk about the Ten Commandments. Okay, after Augustine made this edict, you'll see almost 150 years later, there were three church councils that transformed voluntary death or suicide into an unpardonable sin. And these are the three councils. Okay, so for those of you who are history buffs, you can look these up or Google these. These weren't the only things they talked about these councils, but this was a really important issue for them. Okay. Eventually... Um, Canaan law, which is the church law, became incorporated into secular law, or which was civil law. And so what started off as being an unpardonable sin in the church law eventually became a crime of the state uh, for civil law. And so then it became individuals who died by suicide were not only denied a Christian burial, but their bodies were dishonored as well. Okay, so and I see that you have lots of questions here, and I'm going to get to those in a minute. We're going to have a Two more slides, and they were going to have time for questions. Okay. So in the early church, anyone who completed suicide was not only denied funeral rites of the Eucharist or communion and singing of the Psalms, but their bodies were also hung in public places. Their bodies were burned at the, buried with stakes through the heart. Their families were disgraced. People could, their families could actually lose their land, and the land would have to be given up to the state. Um, and the penalty for attempted suicide was death, so that if someone attempted suicide and didn't actually die from the suicide, they could actually be executed for attempting suicide. So what you can see is that the state's response to suicide really further stigmatized that behavior and made it difficult for people to talk about suicide, but it also made it difficult for the people the family members of the person who completed suicide because it not only was uh, shameful and that their loved ones could not be buried on holy ground, but they could also lose their, their livelihood and all of their property. Okay? So that kind of gives you a sense of um, where some of the stigma came from. And in fact, it's not until the late 19th century, the 1800s, where the focus on suicide shifts from it being a moral and religious issue to people looking at it more from a psychological and sociological perspective. Okay, so let's see if I can see some of the questions here. So we have, I, don't, I do know that clergy today offer mercy and compassion to survivors of suicide. 
knowing that this person who completed suicide is not able to think clearly and suffer from unbearable emotional pain. Okay, that comes from Karen. And so that's true. The Catholic Church um, in particular, what, you're, what she's talking about is actually their, one of their statements about this, that um, they no longer um, view um, suicide as an unpardonable sin as much as they look focus much more on um, focusing on the suffering and the emotional pain from the person who's experiencing suicide. And we have another question. It says the Bible is very clear about suicide. Are you going to identify what the Bible actually says for identifying individuals who suicide, such as Judas? Yes, we are. So great question, and we're going to get to that in a minute. Okay? Are there any other questions about what we've gone over so far about the history? Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on. Okay, now, there are six biblical accounts altogether of suicides. And so I'm not going to go into those in huge detail because of time limitations, but uh, I'm going to cite those really quickly for you. So one is in the book of Judges, the ninth chapter, the 50 through the 57 verses. There's a person there named Abimelech. Abimelech was a warrior. He was involved in a war. And he was ashamed because there was a woman who threw a huge boulder on his head, and he was mortally wounded. And so because it was uh, considered to be um, an assault and sort of an insult that you would allow yourself to be killed by a woman, Abimelech asked his armor bearer to kill him so that it would, couldn't be said that he was killed by a woman in battle. And so his armor bearer actually complies with that and kills him. Then also in the book of Judges in the 16th chapter, there's um, the story about Samson. And Samson, as many of you may know, um, was in love with Delilah, and he, um, she cut his hair, he lost his strength, and he was captured by the Philistines. And so Samson begs Yahweh to give him the strength to bring down pillars to avenge the Philistines binding him. And this is sort of an artistic depiction of Samson right there. Okay, then we have in the text 1 Samuel 31, for 1 through 3, 13, is the story of Saul. And the story of Saul is actually through much of the book of 1 Samuel. But in this particular situation, Saul was also battling the Philistines, um, was also mortally wounded. And in those days, when two different groups of people were battling, it wasn't just um, felt to be a battle between the two groups of people, but it was also felt to be a battle between their two gods. And so it's really a dishonor for you to lose a battle because then you let down not just your people, but you also let down Yahweh. And so it was very common for them after you were killed in battle for them to take the leader and really desecrate that person's body as a sign of disrespect. And so Saul was very concerned because he knew he'd been mortally wounded and they had lost the battle with the Philistines. So he asked his armor bearer to kill him so that his body would not be defiled by the Philistines. His armor bearer was afraid to do that, and so Saul actually falls on his own sword in this particular passage. Book of 2 Samuel, the 17th chapter, there's a person named Ahithophel. And Ahithophel was a person who was one of the generals that sided with um, David's son, Absalom, when David and Absalom um, had a rift between the two of them, and Absalom was basically trying to um, usurp his dad from the throne. So Ahithophel and another general had a battle strategy, and Absalom, David's son, decided to side with the other general rather than Ahithophel's plan for battle. Ahithophel felt really humiliated by that, that, that Absalom didn't side with him, so he went home, and you may have heard the expression, um, get your, go home and get your house in order. That Actually, this scripture is where that comes from. And so Ahithophel goes home, gets his house in order, and then kills himself. I do see the questions that are coming up, and again, we're going to answer those in a minute. Um, and then First Kings, the 16th chapter, is a very brief passage about a, another king named Zimri. Zimri was a king um, who was disobedient to God, and so he was not successful in battle. He dies in a fire when he's defeated by his enemy because, he, again, he doesn't want to be desecrated or um, found by the enemy. And he's condemned not because he completed suicide, but because he disobeyed God. The only New Testament account of, of suicide is from Judas. And that's found in the book of Matthew, the 27th chapter, the 3rd through the 5th verses. In fact, I just recently did a sermon um, on this particular passage. 
and this is after Judas realized that what he has done in portraying uh, Christ, he goes home and he hangs himself. And some people say that um, Judas' suicide was actually uh, a result of his punishment for his betrayal of Christ. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about the Judas passage is that while um, uh, Judas completes suicide, it's interesting that Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. And in fact, when they're at the Last Supper, um, Jesus kisses him right before he talks about the fact that one of his disciples or apostles is going to betray him. So perhaps another interpretation of that is perhaps Judas killed himself because Judas didn't know that there was something beyond the crucifixion, because this was on Friday. Then in spite of his betrayal, God was not yet finished yet with Jesus or with Judas. Okay, so the common theme, if you look at it, if these biblical suicides is Abimelech, Saul, Ahithophel, Zimri, and Samson, these are all the passages that we just went over, have a loss of status or relationship. In each situation, they are trying to avoid being ashamed and humiliated, which was really important in Hebrew culture. It's sometimes hard for us to grasp how important the issue of not being humiliated and shamed was not only important to individuals in that culture, but important to families as well. But if you also think about it, it's also something that um, our young people, particularly young males, um, is also a factor involved in their um, suicide attempts and completions as well, particularly when you, for example, look at some of the gay youth who have um, been brought to our attention in the media, that this issue of shame and being humiliated is still a big factor when we talk about suicide even today. Okay. Now, what's interesting, and, and you need to go back and read these passages in detail, in each of these passages, the Bible doesn't comment one way or the other about the suicide. So there is no scripture in either the Old or New Testament that says suicide is a sin or that suicide is bad. In each of those passages, there's just a description about what happened. Okay, And so there is no Hebrew word for suicide in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, which is also interesting. And that suggests to us that the idea of suicide, as we know it today, is something that happened later on and was not there at the time that the text was written. Because there is no, if you read the, the original text in Hebrew, the word suicide does not appear in there. So there's no comment about it one way or another. Okay, so we have lots of comments and questions. Um, one person says, it's interesting, there's no judgment on suicide in the Bible, and that's true. We're going to talk in a minute about um, where our thoughts about that come up again, and we're going to talk about the difference between Scripture and theology. Um, someone also commented that it's, um, this issue about being disrespected is really important in gang membership. That's absolutely true. And some, um, some scholars and social scientists and actually clinicians believe that some of the homicides that they are engaged in with gang members are also victim-precipitated homicide. I've certainly had a couple of cases um, that I've worked with in rehab hospitals and people who have been significantly, severely injured, that when you talk to some of the young men, you find out that really they were really depressed, um, very despondent, feeling that they had no future, and they sort of put themselves in situations um, where they feel like they're going to probably be, um, be, be killed by someone else, okay? And I'm going to just do one more because we only have about 30 minutes left. I want to make sure we get through most of our presentation today. We can go a little bit over if you like. I don't know if everyone can remain on the line. Um, and someone also commented, so there's, is there a definitive difference between martyrdom and suicide as in the case of terrorism? Good question. Um, in some cultures, what, what one cultural group might think of as terrorism, another cultural group might think of as martyrdom. And that certainly is um, a factor when you look at some of the, um, the suicide bombings that are going on in the Middle East. So what, that's, why that's such a great question is it talks to you again or speaks to the issue of context. So what looks like martyrdom in one community may look like terrorism in another. Most people who do suicide research, and particularly survivors of suicide, survivors of suicide are people who have lost a loved one to suicide, do not like – 
the term suicide bombing to be attributed to what they consider to be terrorist acts. And the reason for that is because they feel that the intention of the behavior is completely different. So that in the suicides that we're talking about today, we're talking about a person who wants to harm him or herself, not because of a broader cause and certainly not to martyr him or herself. The issue is an individual act. Um, in the biblical text, though, sometimes, um, particularly the case of Samson, people argue that that was martyrdom, that actually Samson was doing that for the greater good of the people. What I would encourage you to do is look at that text more carefully because actually Samson's not doing that for the people. He's really doing that because he's upset that he's been humiliated. Um, and so someone just um, put it in a, a, a comment that martyrdom is self-sacrifice. Terrorism is about harming others, yes. But again, it depends on your context because from some cultural perspectives, martyrdom is about not just about self-sacrifice. The motivating um, force behind that behavior is they feeling that in killing these other people, it's for the greater good of another group. Okay. So it's really, 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 so these are all interesting questions. I wish I had time to answer them all and we could talk more about them. But certainly want to encourage you to kind of think about this. I think if nothing else, you'll see that it's not that clear cut, is it? It's not sort of yes or no or black or white. This is a really complex issue, and it's really hard to some kind, sometimes to tease out um, uh, what suicide is and isn't and what it means in different communities. Okay? So I do want us to go ahead and move on, though, so we can have time to kind of get through um, at least most of the presentation today. So I want to talk a little bit more about um, what suicide meant in the early church and then what it means in, the, in the, today's church, and then we can get to what can we do about this today. Okay, so in the early rabbinic writings or under Jewish law, it was actually believed to, suicide was actually considered to be justifiable under certain conditions, and they're very specific. So if someone tried to force you to commit idolatry, if someone tried to force a person to commit murder, or if someone tried to force a person to engage in forbidden sexual acts, Suicide in those situations was actually not condemned. It was considered to be justifiable. In the modern church, we generally have two responses to suicide. Um, and I'm oversimplifying this to some degree. But there's either condemnation of suicide, which some of you have talked about already, or, and, or there's compassion towards a suicidal person, and particularly towards the family members who are left behind. Okay, so, and again, we're kind of, doing kind of a simplification of this, but this is the general stance that most churches will take. Now, for those who believe, um, or those who have a, a stance of condemnation against suicide, the basis of that condemnation is that life is a gift from God, and only God has the power to take life. And these are some scriptures, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, um, 4a, 24, Genesis 9 through 5 particularly is used a lot. Um, those are some scriptures that are used to support this argument. Um, and that since homicide is condemned, the condemnation for homicide should extend to suicide as well, because in some ways, in this viewpoint, suicide is viewed as self-murder. I, I want to just make sure you know I do see your questions, and we are going to have a, a, a point where we can ask, stop for questions again. Okay. Yet the Bible is also filled with examples where the Israelites not only kill others, but they feel that God is on their side in the killing or in the homicides. And so, again, one of the things we have to learn how to do is wrestle with the text because it's not so clear-cut when is it okay to kill other people and when is it not, even though there's a clear prohibition against homicide. There are also, as someone mentioned earlier, there are lots of people in the Bible who feel depressed and feel despair but don't attempt suicide. And these are just some examples of passages where that's true. I think someone mentioned earlier in the chat, Job, uh, Jonah, Elijah in 1 Kings 19, Moses in Numbers, David in Psalm 22. In fact, one of the words that Christ uttered on the cross comes from Psalm 22. So these are certainly just some examples of people who felt depressed, felt despair, um, but did not attempt to take their lives. <coughs> The other stance, having compassion towards the person who is suicidal, the emphasis is placed more on forgiving and not judging the suicide. And so this stance is not advocating suicide, which I think a lot of people worry about, that if you say that it's not an unpardonable sin, well, then you have an increase in suicide. So the issue is not that it's a good thing to do. The issue is that is there something you can do 
that cannot be forgiven. So the focus is on forgiving the person. And some scriptures that support this viewpoint are Psalm 139, 8 through 10, Daniel 3 through 6, uh, chapter 3, 16 to 18, and someone asked about martyrdom. Some people argue that Daniel going into the lion's den, into the fiery furnace, is an example of martyrdom. In Romans 8, 38 through 39, which talks about that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay. So when you peop- churches that have the compassionate view towards suicidal persons and their families advocate that our worst mistakes don't negate God's grace. So in other words, there's nothing you can do that will negate God's grace for you. And they would argue that the greatest evidence for this is the cross because in some ways the cross represents humanity at its worst. For those of you who believe in a Trinitarian God, it was humanity's attempt to kill God, even if they didn't recognize that. But it is also an example of the greatest um, moment in humanity in terms of what God was willing to do to save us. Hollinger, who was a religious scholar, talks about the fact that our theology of suicide is intimately connected with our theology of suffering. And theology is the study of the nature of God and God's relationship with humanity. There's a textbook that many people use in seminary called um, by Magliori, and it talks about faith-seeking understanding. And so that theology is basically faith-seeking to understand who we are in relationship to God, and also who, what is the essence of God? What is the nature of God? What are the characteristics of God? There are two common views of suffering in the world. Um, this is outside of the church. And so that suffering is an unqualified evil that we should eliminate at all costs. But in Christian theology, uh, suffering is viewed a little bit differently. Suffering can also be viewed as a challenge to persevere and an opportunity to overcome. And again, these are just some scriptures that support that viewpoint. James, the first chapter, 3 through 4, and Romans 5, 3 through 5. Now, many of you have mentioned in your questions um, the suffering of Job. So Job is sort of the quintessential person that you can talk about in the biblical text when you talk about suffering. And particularly, it's a great um, book in the Bible to study the theology of suffering because it really, um, the, the trials of Job really speak to how people wrestle with suffering, how we understand what suffering means in our lives, and particularly how we understand God's role in suffering. And so in the passages of, Bi- of the Bible in Job, the book of Job, Job becomes suicidal throughout the book. And so sometimes we say the people should have the patience of Job. But actually, after the third chapter of Job, pa- Job is actually not very patient. He gets upset with God and with his friends. So he's not patient. He's patient for three chapters after that. He's not. When we look at the text carefully, we'll find that Job becomes suicidal not because he's suffering, but because he doesn't understand the point or the meaning to his suffering. If you think about it, we all grapple with that as well. It's, it's not so much that we don't want to suffer, maybe we expect not to suffer, but what's the point of all of this? Why are we going through all of this? And certainly people who are suicidal also feel that way. What's the point of the anguish that I'm experiencing it, and why doesn't it go away? So the questions that Job asks in the text are what we call a theodicy. And a theodicy is basically the the feeling or the viewpoint of how can a just God, how can a God who's supposed to be fair and loving and kind allow innocent people to suffer? And it's not just in the context of Job that you ask this. I certainly know when you have natural disasters and innocent people are killed in floods and in hurricanes and tsunamis, issues of theodicy come up then or when people are killed in a fire, when people are killed randomly by sniper uh, gunshot or people are killed in wars or people who are just good people who when, whenever you certainly hear of a child being murdered or being sexually abused, then the question of theodicy comes up again and again in all of our lives. Why, if we serve a God who is just and fair and loving, why do people who are completely innocent haven't done anything wrong? Why are they allowed to suffer? And so at different points in the text, Job questions God's leadership in the world. He kind of says to God, you know, if you're all who you say you are, then why do you let these bad things happen to nice people? And he begins to feel hopeless and also, what's the purpose of my life? And again, why this is, why this is important is because people 
who are experiencing suicidal thoughts and feelings are also grappling with these same issues in our churches. So they're trying to figure out, you know, what's the point? Why am I asking myself and other people asking me to endure all this suffering if it's never going to end? What's the point to all of this? But the key thing in the text of Job is that Job does not attempt suicide because in spite of his, his suffering, he continues to seek God. Throughout that text, Job constantly talks to God. He's not always happy, happy, joy, joy with God, but he's always talking with God and having a dialogue with God. So Job has to answer in the text something that we all have to grapple with, which is what are you willing to do, what are you willing to endure to be in a relationship with God. For Christians, Christ is God's answer to what God is willing to endure to be in relationship with us. And so, and and we see that because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that God was willing to sacrifice God's only begotten Son to be in relationship with us. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we willing to do to be in relationship with God regardless of the rewards and, or punishments involved? And the highest form of worship is being able to be in love and be in relationship with a God who doesn't always guarantee that your desires will be granted. So the theological and psychological message of Job is that Job is strengthened by adversity, that mental anguish turns into mental fortitude, and that helplessness turns into hopefulness. Now, someone asked of the question, a really good question, does a suicidal person always feel both hopeless and helpless? Not always, but oftentimes, yes. So there's a, there's a sense of nothing I do makes me feel better. There's a sense of um, things aren't, which is the helplessness. And the lack of hopefulness is the, uh, what's the point of going through all of this, that um, in spite of all of my best efforts, things don't get better. And that's the hopelessness that you see. So when you're thinking about working, particularly those of you who are faith leaders um, or who are clergy, when you're thinking about working with, with suicidal persons in your congregations, the questions you're going to have to ask yourself and how you handle this is, what is your understanding of suffering? What's your theology of suffering? And how do you convey this to people that you're called to minister to? Okay? What's your understanding of suffering? And how does that shape how you respond to someone who's suicidal? Okay, so we're going to take maybe one or two questions because we have about 15 minutes left. Um, one question was, can you comment on the biblical instruction to take care of the body of one's temple versus intentionally hurting oneself due to diffuse, to diffuse your internal pain? Okay, um, certainly the Bible talks about in several passages that our bodies are a temple. This is similar to the concept that your body and your life itself is a gift from God, and so you are. To, and the way that you honor God is by taking care of your body. Um, and then there's also we do know that some people um, engage in self-cutting or self-mutilation. Self-cutting or self-mutilation per se is not necessarily a suicide attempt or a gesture. Sometimes when people have extreme levels of anxiety. Um, they cut their bodies to relieve anxiety, and unfortunately it's a very reinforcing experience because in the immediate sense you do get relief from the anxiety. Those are um, symptoms that are common in lots of different disorders, including borderline personality disorder um, and depression. Um, so it's not um, per se a sign of suicide, and it's not per se um, a suicide attempt, but it is something that we have to take seriously. So can you use texts that are talking about keeping your body as a temple and honoring your body and not hurting your body? Yes, you can. But you also have to understand that that's part of a symptom of, a, of what can be a severe disorder. And so it's important, and we're going to talk about this later on, to, to, to do the, the spiritual work with the person, but also to get them professional mental health help. Okay, the other question was, whether it's suicide or a GLBT issue, what it boils down to is how the people you come in contact with in church determine whether you are condemned or not. I'm not quite sure I, answer, I know what you mean by that, but I think what you're saying is that uh, regardless of whether it's, whatever the stigmatizing issue is, whether it's suicide or GLBT issues, one of the issues 
um, becomes is, does that person experience condemnation when they're trying to interact in a faith community or belong to a faith community? And if that is, if I'm understanding your question or comment correctly, I wholeheartedly agree. So one of the things that we have to ask ourselves in our faith-based communities is what kinds of messages do we give people who are feeling stigmatized for whatever reason? And do people hear messages in sermons, Bible studies? Thank you. She says, yes, that's what I meant. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Sunday school lessons, people uh, talking and passing, where people feel that church is not a safe place for them to go. It's not a safe place where they feel that they can belong. It's not a place where they can feel loved. Okay. And so one of the things that we share in my church is that regardless of your viewpoint on whether it's suicide or GLBT issues, what we're really clear on from a Christian standpoint is that Jesus came to love everyone and that Jesus came to to create a community that people call the whosoever will. So the whosoever will come will come. So whether you think it's a sin or not a sin, all people should feel welcome in the house of God. Secondly, particularly in the African-American community, you have to appreciate that most people are not going to go to a mental health professional. So the church might be the only haven or safe place where they can find some solace and some comfort and some support. So you have to really think through carefully what kinds of messages that you give because you might literally be that person or that community that can help to save someone's life. And the messages that you give, sometimes even in passing, may make people really feel like, I don't even have, now even God can't love me. And for someone who's severely depressed, the sense of I'm not even lovable to God can be absolutely devastating, particularly if um, they are very um, much integrated or grew up in a faith-based community. So one of the things that I always strongly tell people, I never tell people what to think about the theology. For the mental health professionals out there, you're not going to change people's theology. So that's not the place to start this dialogue. But what is important to think about is, I think what we can all agree on is that we want people to be helped and that the messages that we give people and the interactions that we have with them, whether you're a mental health provider, a school counselor, a teacher, a concerned parent, a friend, a buddy, um, a clergy person, that those messages that you give people make a huge difference in whether or not people feel welcomed and can come and talk to you about the things that are concerning their hearts. So I think it's important for us to really think about that. Okay, let's see. So Brandy says we only have 10 minutes left, but we can go over time or at least make sure you get through your slides. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on about what the faith-based community can do. And then what we'll do is we'll save the questions for last, and, we'll, and for those of you who want to stay on the line, we can take the questions at that time. Okay, so it's really important, I just said this actually, that clergy and mental health professionals understand that mental health challenges in general, and suicide in particular, is viewed as a faith crisis for religious and spiritual um, people, so that you understand that when people are thinking about these thoughts or feelings, that it's not just a mental health challenge, it's also a faith crisis for them. So one of the things that we can think about is what can we do to help, and I'm going to really encourage development, the development of partnerships with the mental health community and faith-based communities. Why? Because African Americans engage in more private and public religious behaviors than any other racial and ethnic group in the United States. African Americans are more likely to seek help from clergy for mental health concerns anyway. Um, certainly before I became um, a minister, people... Um, were much more likely to come see me as a minister, I realized that, than they would as a licensed psychologist. Um, African Americans feel, report feeling satisfied with the help that they receive from clergy. And also, really importantly, once people seek help from a clergy person because they're satisfied, they are much less likely to go seek help from a mental health professional after that. Now, having said that, and also having gone to seminary and taught in seminary at Howard University, most clergy persons do not have the training to deal with serious mental health challenges. So that's our dilemma. How can we get people to get the help they need and do it in a way that's helpful to them, that encourages them to seek help, but also making sure that they get all the help that they need? So barriers to getting help, I'm just going to go through some of these really quickly, include um, access to mental health care treatment, being under or, un or uninsured, the cultural competence of providers. We do know that mental health professionals are um, less likely to deal with spiritual needs of their clients um, because most of us have been retrained not to do that. Um, beliefs that blacks don't engage in suicidal behavior. 
suicide is a white thing, quote unquote. Black men are too macho for suicide. Black women have what I call the superwoman syndrome, where black women think they're resilient, they don't have pressures, and they don't or they don't crack under pressure. Uh, distrust of mental health professionals. Sometimes I talk to church, go to churches to do presentations, and they'll say, "Well, therapists are heathens. They don't believe in God, so I can't talk to someone who doesn't believe in God." Or they'll try to take away my um, health, my faith beliefs. Um, Sometimes in church we get the message that seeking help, professional help, is a spiritual weakness, and we've already talked about the issue about suicide being an unpardonable sin. But because I'm an eternally optimistic person, I think that there are things that we can do. Um, I really think it's important that mental health professionals and churches develop partnerships, and these are just some examples of things that you can do. Uh, Mental health professionals can certainly um, come and do workshops in the church, and I've done that for many, many years. Really importantly, develop a resource directory and a referral system. Work with the mental health providers in your community. There are also local and state and national organizations that can give you listings of providers in the community. Why is it so important? Because when someone's in a crisis, you don't want to be trying to find someone to refer them to. You want to already develop a partnership and a relationship so that that phone number or that resource is at your fingertips. So one of you comment, refer, 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 and you're absolutely right. It's so important to refer people for help. You can also create ministries in the church that decrease risk factors like depression and delinquency and substance abuse and increase protective families. There are ministries that you can do, for example, that help to strengthen families, as we know that's a protective factor. We know that when you engage youth in ministries in the church, and it could be a basketball league, it could be a rites of passage, um, all of those things can also help people. Uh, one of the um, persons online says, pray and refer about it from the pulpit, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Creating support systems in the church. Know the warning signs for suicide. And again, refer people for professional services. And then this comment gets to that person's comment. Give people permission to seek help in the church through sermons, Bible study, and Sunday school, because as wonderful as the workshops are and the health fairs are, oftentimes at health fairs and workshops you're preaching to the choir. The people who think this is important are going to come to the workshops, and the people who are scared or who feel stigmatized will not. But on Sunday morning, if your Sabbath is on a Sunday, in Bible study in Sunday school, you have a captive audience. And so in our church, in the Beloved Community Church, we do this all the time. We have actually, we call them... Um, Fit for the Kingdom, which are our health, mental health moments. And every Sunday, at least twice a month, we talk about health and we talk about mental health issues in the church. It takes five minutes. We have brochures involved. Uh, We have handouts for people. We put stuff in bulletins. You can put the suicide 1-800 number in your bulletin every week so that people in the church will have that. But also, you want to do sermons where you encourage people to seek help for problems both physical health problems and mental health problems. And those are very, very powerful because what you're doing is you're creating a norm in your church environment that says it's okay to talk about these issues, that there's no stigma or shame involved in talking about them, and that it's okay to seek professional help. Okay, really quickly, we're almost out of time. How many of you have ever heard a minister talk about uh, suicide in a sermon or a Bible study lesson? Okay, so most people have said no. Okay, I think that's everybody. So as you can see, 81% of you have never heard anyone talk about suicide in a Bible study or a uh, sermon lesson. Okay, these are some texts that you can use to talk about depression. Uh, There's lots and lots of texts. Most of the major prophets in the Bible at some point talk about being depressed. Numbers passage is Moses. 1 Kings 19 is a passage about um, Elijah. Mark 5 is the man who's in the the cemetery who is uh, talking and living amongst the dead. That's a very wonderful, powerful scripture that you can use um, to talk about mental illness and also the community's response to people who are mentally ill. And stop doing what I call um, 
fake it until you make it theology, which sometimes we say those things in church environments, but really it's not okay to fake it until you make it because there's help that's available out there. And we want to encourage people to, to not fake it or pretend or mask feelings and symptoms, but really to go and get help for it. In a suicide crisis, we're almost done. It's so important to listen and not judge, to take every complaint seriously, to trust your own judgment. If you're feeling that this person is, is, is not telling you everything, you know, be compassionate, but keep the person there and keep talking to them until you can get them to open up a little bit more about what's really going on with them. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't ask, act shocked or upset if someone says to you, yes, I am thinking about taking my own life. Sometimes people will be sad and depressed, and then all of a sudden they're, they're instantly, um, everything's fine. So sometimes that's misleading, and don't allow yourself to be misled by that. Okay? Be affirming and supportive. You want to keep stressing to the person that there is hope, there is help out there, because as someone asked earlier, people often feel hopeless and helpless. So it's really important to keep continue to let people say, know that there is um, uh, hope and help out there. Important to know the warning signs. Give permis- people permission to seek help again. And also for clergy persons, remember that you're an important member of the team, but it takes a team. It's just like it takes a village to raise children. It takes a team to provide holistic services for people who are experiencing suicidal thoughts or who have made suicide attempts. So it's really important to see yourself as part of a team. So with a minute to go, I've gotten through all the slides. <laughs> so just wanted to let you know we can do this together that we have the scientific community, the faith community, we have the academic community, and we have the community. And we can all do this. We work on this together. So I want to thank you for your time and your uh, questions. And if if those of you could stay on for a few more minutes, we can uh, try to uh, answer some of the questions. Yes, Dr. Mudlock, I'd just like to chime in here. Brandy Brooks again from the department. We do have a few extra minutes, so if some of you have some questions, please type them in the chat function, and Dr. Mudlock and I will extend the webinar for a few minutes to respond to a few questions. Um, For those of you who do have to leave, um, feel free to do so. Thank you so much for participating. The slides, as Dr. Mudlock mentioned earlier, will be emailed to you. And a podcast of the webinar will be uploaded onto the DPH departmental website. So that being said, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Mullick so she can answer a few of your questions that are coming in. Okay, great. Let's see. I'm going to go through here. I think this is more of a, a comment. Someone says, people trust their pastors. They tell them they can provide. Oops. Got to kind of skip down there just one second. Uh, I lost the comment. Okay, if they tell them they can provide spiritual guidance, but a therapist can help them with mental health congregants, will they do it? Um, That's a great question. Yes, my experience has been that when people are told by their pastors that the pastor's role on the team is to provide the spiritual guidance, but the mental health professional is there to provide the the emotional support and uh, or therapeutic uh, input and guidance, yes, that works really well. In fact, I actually have worked with um, clergy in both roles. So I've also, I, have also, I have been the clergy person who provides the spiritual uh, counseling while a therapist, a licensed therapist, is providing the um, psychological counseling, and I've also been the therapist who provides the therapeutic counseling and the clergy provides the spiritual counseling. So I've actually done that both ways. It's a great opportunity to work with a colleague looking at a different perspective on how to help people um, get better. Um, so I really, really, really like that a lot, um, and I think that's a really important uh, uh, way that you can build teams that way. Okay. It's important to – one of the things that's hard for me is that when you all add your comments, then what happens is I lose your chat. So it's important to view a mental health issue on the same level as a physical issue. You would not refer someone to a prayer group alone for a severe car accident. You would refer them to the doctor. In the same fashion, mental health problems should be referred to a professional in addition to support, church support. I agree, but it's also important to to, um, to really value at what everyone brings to the table. So, um, because what I said earlier is that suicide is not just a mental health crisis; it is also often a faith crisis as well. And so that's why it's so important to have both parties on the team. You really want to have the clergy person involved, that the person's part of a, 
of a spiritual or faith community, and you also want to have the mental health professional involved as well because all of those inputs are really important. And even when people have physical health problems, um, a lot of hospitals now have chaplains on call and on staff for that very reason that you want to make sure that you treat the whole person. So in addition to being in a bad car accident and the surgeons um, dealing with the injuries that are physical, this is also we know that people who have um, severe accidents or who have chronic illnesses are also depressed. And so you want to have a mental health professional available, and it may also present a, a, a moment of a spiritual crisis for that person as well. So it's not an either-or issue. It's really you want to have everybody involved on the team because it's the whole person that you're trying to treat and not just a part of them. Another question is, in small towns, how much counseling is expected of a pastor where mental health is not available? Excellent question. That's a big challenge because I think in small towns, um, a lot is expected of the pastor because you may not have mental health resources available. There is some burgeoning resources and uh, research on what people call teletherapy, um, where providers can provide counseling on the web. Um, there are some pros and cons to doing that. Some people feel that you really need to meet with people in person to do an accurate assessment, particularly of trying to assess someone's mood. Uh, on the other hand, with webcams and Skype available now, um, and bottom line is just lack of resources. That's something that I think communities can start thinking about. Is there a way that you can, for example, provide some of the counseling um, through webinars or through Skyping um, where you can actually see the person or at least talk with the person on the phone? And because we lack the resources to treat, to have enough providers in every community, that's something that we may have to think about. Um, Ministers can also get um, degrees in pastoral counseling, and pastoral counselors are able to um, manage the care of people who have many kinds of problems, um, not so much severe depression, but other kinds of mild to maybe moderate depression. The other thing that um, people who have pastoral counseling backgrounds can do is develop a working relationship with a physician. So, And certainly psychologists, we do that also because we don't prescribe medications. And so many of the people that I have treated with depression have been on medication, but I don't prescribe the medication. And so I work closely with that person's primary care physician or with a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist and I work together on monitoring um, the per how they're doing on their meds. Because for the most part, if I'm the treating therapist, I'm going to be seeing them weekly. They may see their psychiatrist every six weeks or so. And so again, what I'm really stressing, you hear me say over and over again, it's important to work as a team. We all have our expertise. We all have important things to bring to the table. And our goal is not to be territorial, but our goal is really to help the person get the best holistic treatment that they possibly can, and all of us have an important role to play. Another question, are there specific types of therapy that mesh well with spiritual support? For example, art therapy and music therapy. Certainly art therapy is particularly in inpatient facilities is used quite frequently, so is music therapy, which is a way to get people to, um, to um, express themselves, so that's very helpful. Um, I don't know if there's specific types of therapy that per se that mesh well with spiritual support. It's more, I think, professionals being open to, to taking a holistic approach and to using different modalities or means by which to make sure that we make pe that people can have optimal well-being. What are the resources for available for clergy to get help with their issues with GLBT or drugs or gangs or whatever in order to support their congregants? Great question. Almost every state in the United States has lots of, they have, there are state associations, so you can look at your Department of Mental Health and Hygiene to get information which will tell you about the therapeutic resources that are available in the community. Another good place to go to is Mental Health America's website, which is www.mha.org. Mental Health America is a nonprofit organization which works with communities um, to prevent mental health problems, and so they have lots and lots of good brochures and resources and networks available. They also will be able to give you some information about providers in the area. Another great organization that you can partner with is NAMI, capital N, capital A, capital M, capital I. Another great resource, which Brandy mentioned earlier, is NOPCUS, which stands for the, no the National Organization of People of Color Against Suicide, and their website is www nopcas.org, and they have lots of good resources available um, for particularly about suicide in the African-American community and in communities of color. 
um, which those other uh, sites may not have, is that specifically about communities of color. Um, NAFCAS, I believe, also can help you somewhat with finding a provider. So NAMI, MHA, NAFCAS can help with revision of, of finding providers in your community. Uh, the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene or Department of Health and Human Services in your state can also help you find providers as well. Okay, another question was, I have heard that depression is anger toward inward. Is this belief, is this still viewed as a fact? No. Um, depression is really a complex disorder. It is probably caused by um, biochemical imbalances in your brain and we also know that there's stress stressors in the environment that can um, sort of trigger depressive episodes. So it's not necessarily viewed as anger term within anymore, but it's basically viewed as a biomedical illness, which has emotional components to it. And again, it's something that um, different types of providers can provide treatment for, but it's not viewed as anger turned inward anymore. Another question was, how do you report threatening suicide to authorities Okay, how, do, how does reporting threatening, su threatening suicide to authorities act as a deterrent for people coming to talk to either a minister or a counselor? I'm not sure I, I understand that. I think uh, what you're saying, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is if you threaten the person, if you threaten to report the person who says they're suicidal, how is that a deterrent? Okay, so if you are, like me, a mental health provider, um, there are certain people who are required to um, report a suicide. And um, you're not required to report a suicide to a, a, a police officer, so I want to clarify that. But what you are obligated to do is provide that person with, make sure that person gets services. Occasionally that may involve you calling law enforcement if the person will not voluntarily go into a hospital and you believe that person is in imminent danger of harming him or herself. And the key word there is imminent. So, um, if you believe that, if, for example, imminent would be that that person leaves your office, that they're going to be completing suicide within the next 24 to 48 hours, you are required by law to make sure that person is protected from harming him or herself. Um, so, the issue, so I think the issue or the question has to do with if you're going to be threatening people with, with sorry, involuntary hospitalization, how are you going to get them to trust you to talk with you about this? As a clinician, I tell people up front that I'm going to have to do this, and I also put this in the context of, though, my goal is not to threaten you or to make you do something against your will. My goal is always to make sure you're safe and that you're okay. And normally in the years that I've been doing this, I've never had to call the police. That's actually this. I've called the police twice. And in both cases, they were young people who ran away from home. We thought they were suicidal and they were not sitting in my office at the time. This is their parents who called me to let me know that they had run away and were suicidal. So we normally try to uh, refrain from having to call law enforcement unless we cannot ourselves talk the person into going into treatment. Normally what you want to do if you're in that situation is you want to use your relationship with that person to show compassion and concern to help the person realize that you're not suggesting that they go into the hospital to punish them, but you really are concerned about their well-being and you're really afraid that the way they're feeling right now, that you cannot guarantee that they won't harm him or themselves. And so that's the, what, the reason why you're doing that. So I think it's a good question, but I think the, what I try to do is reframe that so that the person understands that I'm not trying to do something to punish them or to say that they're a bad person, that going to the hospital is not a punishment, but it's a way to facilitate their healing. And I think if you put it in that context and frame it, reframe it that way, that usually that has worked pretty well for me. Okay, I think um, those are all the persons, all the questions that I see. Um, 
So I think I'm going to thank everyone for being in on the call. Brandy, did you want to say something before we hang up? Um, yes, just some parting words. Again, I'd like to echo Dr. Mullick's statement. I'd like to thank you all for participating. As I said earlier, I will be emailing all the slides to you in a follow-up email. I'll also be posting this webinar as a podcast on the departmental website, the Mass um, website, which is www.mass.com slash dph slash suicide prevention. But don't worry if you don't copy it down. It will be coming to you in an email. Um, again, I hope you gained knowledge and insight about this very important issue. Uh, thank you all for participating. Have a wonderful day. And if there are any, no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and disconnect the conference line now. Thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you. Please stand by.